Van harte welkom bij weer een nieuwe uitzending van Christen voor Israël. Heel fijn dat u ook vanavond weer met ons verbonden bent. En we hebben een hele bijzondere gast hier in de studio uit Israël. Zijn naam is Rabijn Kalman Samuels. Hij is de oprichter van Shalva, een organisatie in Israël die een heleboel hulp geeft aan kinderen met een beperking. Daar gaan we het straks heel uitgebreid over hebben. Hij is de oprichter van deze organisatie en gaat ons vertellen hoe die überhaupt op het idee is gekomen om deze organisatie op te richten. Raf Kalman, welkom. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. When I was uh, preparing for this conversation, I was looking at some interviews uh, online and I saw that nobody is calling you Mr. Samuels or uh, Rabbi or something, but everybody calls you Kalman. What is happening there? A person studies and has titles. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. so yes, I have a title. I became a rabbi. And yet, in my personal life, I just love it when people are not at a distance with me, mm -hmm. especially in the fact that I work with children at Shalva who are with disabilities, and they have no problem, and nobody calls me rabbi. It's Kalman, 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 20 times a day, oh, yeah. but it's Kalman. And I've always just felt more comfortable with that. And So That's, I can call you Coleman. No, Coleman. you must call me Rabbi. I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you would describe your organization, Shalva, in one sentence, what would you say? It's inspiring hope, changing lives, where we're truly, truly empowering children and their entire family mm -hmm. to lead quality lives. Not only children, but the entire family. The emphasis has always been yeah. on the family very significant. Okay, we're going to uh, talk more of course about this later, but first we're going to get a little bit of an image and feeling of the work of Shalva and we are going to watch a short video. There's magic in this place. My soul so weary. What is so beautiful about Shalva is that they put the family and the child first. Shalva is home. Shalva is family. It's new day at Shalva. It's a new day with love and happiness. To understand the magic that is Shalva, you have to come here to see the center, the scale, the impact. And only then you can really understand what is Shalva. Shalva in Jeruzalem is een van de grootste organisaties in Israël voor kinderen met een beperking. Maar er is een groep die nog niet genoeg geholpen wordt en daar willen we samen voor in actie komen. Jong volwassenen met een beperking die anders tussen wal en schip vallen. Shalva staat klaar om hen te verwelkomen met alles wat ze nodig hebben. The early intervention unit at Shalva is groundbreaking. Essentially, we're developing something new, something that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, hydrotherapy, massage treatments, sensory treatments. The All Hygiene Wellness Clinic for Preventative Dentistry at Chalva is the only one of its kind in Israel and in the world. Children's activities in the after-school programs and also in inclusive programs together with children without disabilities allows them to develop an unbelievable sense of self-confidence. So It makes them feel that they are not different from any other child. Paul has Down syndrome. Um, I um, got up each morning facing the unknown. Every day began with despair. I don't think it's easy knowing that your child has no friends, that no one wants to go to him, that he's simply all alone. From the moment we came to Shalva, everything changed. We came to the Me and My Mummy program. We understood we had joined a new family. When Tal came home happy, the whole household became a happy one. Tal has been a Chalva for the past 14 years. He's been in the Chalva band for four years. 
performing across Israel and around the world. For the past year, Tal's also been working in Café Chalva. Shalva wil een nieuwe afdeling bouwen waar juist deze jongvolwassenen met een beperking hulp gaan krijgen. Met allerlei activiteiten en specialistische zorg om hen te helpen om zo goed mogelijk te integreren in de samenleving. Samen met u willen we in actie komen om deze afdeling mogelijk te maken. En daar is geld voor nodig. Helpt u de jongeren van Shalva met uw gift? Shalva, we don't only think about the child today. We think about the child tomorrow. How he will be when he grows up. Raise me up there's warmth, there's love, there's meaning. Every child with special needs needs a mother, a father, and Shalva. Kalman. You grew up in a non-religious uh, family in Vancouver, in Canada? Yes, on the West Coast, mm -hmm. magnificent, most beautiful city in North America. Uh, it is perched between the mountains and the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. And we were very Jewish, yeah. a little bit traditional, but we were not observant. And uh, while there were certain elements of religion in the home in terms of kosher food, mm -hmm. uh, when we stepped out of the home, there the community didn't have anything facilities of kosher restaurants and we simply you know ate and did what we wanted mm -hmm. and on the shabbat you know we always had on friday night a shabbat meal but you know after the meal there was nothing sort of as orthodox jews would do mm -hmm. and uh, yes and i was very involved with sports and with other things and uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful childhood. So, but now you are obviously ob observant as a Jew. Uh, what changed? Do you have time for me to tell? A little bit. Okay, <laughs> so we'll tell you very briefly. At the age of 18, yeah. I graduated high school and I went to very big public high schools with, you know, everybody. And as I left high school, I had a lot of opportunities. I had uh, several academic scholarships. And I also had a basketball scholarship to university. Mm -hmm. And I was quite an athlete in many sports. And uh, I studied the first year locally, mm -hmm. philosophy, mathematics. And I had a professor who used to mock all these young people in 1970. I was very much a child of the mm -hmm. 60s. I even had hair in those days. Yeah. And uh, he used to mock the people going to India and to China, saying that they had no yardstick with which to measure another major uh, civilization. Mm -hmm. If you want to get a handle and understand another civilization, you must first study your own. And therefore, I urge you to spend your first four years of university studying Western civilization. Mm -hmm. And I really bought into what he was saying. And that's what I did. So on my second year, I was on my way to France mm -hmm. and my mother to study. And my mother asked me to visit Israel for two weeks. We had some distant relatives I'd never met there. And I traveled to Israel. Mm -hmm. And after two weeks, I realized, or during that two weeks, I spoke to many people there. I realized there's much more here in Israel than I had ever realized or been had learned in my Sunday school, you know, Jewish studies programs. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example? For I had no idea what the Western Wall was about, mm -hmm. or the fact that there once really was a temple in that area. And I had no idea what Jerusalem looked like. And uh, I had no idea when I visited a, a worked on a kibbutz in the very far north on the Lebanese border mm -hmm. for several days, just having a good time picking fruits. But I was shown the tower where they watched over the fence to see if there's any terrorists coming. Mm. And I realized this wasn't Vancouver. This was something else. A different world. Actually. And I'll give you even a better example mm. that when I was on a beach south of Eilat, in those days, it was three years after the Six Day War. Mm -hmm. So it was still Israel before they made peace and gave it back to uh, Egypt. Um, 
and I was on a beach some eight kilometers south, magnificent beach, and I looked across the little Gulf of Aqaba, and I asked an Israeli, what am I looking at? So he said, well, across the way is Jordan, the mountains south is Saudi Arabia, and to the left, of course, is Israel, mm -hmm. and we're standing on what was Egypt. And I suddenly had a thought that, well, you know, maybe Vancouver is not really the center of the world, as I sort of felt when I was growing up, as I think every child does. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is much larger and much, you know, older than I had sort of ever sensed. So after two weeks, I made a decision that I'm not going to go to France yet. I'm going to push off my trip for six weeks. After six weeks, I said, I'm going to push it off till the end of the summer, and then I'll continue my studies. Okay. By the end of the summer, I said, I'm going to take a year off. And that's when my father, who was a successful lawyer, really flipped out. That you have scholarships, you can't do this. I did it. And by the end of that year, I had already become religious. And I realized that if I'm going to be a academic, it won't be in the field of Western civilization, it'll be in the field of Jewish studies. Right, but that's and a big change, yeah, becoming religious. It was an enormous change. Was it difficult? That people, friends said that, you know, my name is Kalman, but on my passport I have an English name, mm -hmm. and it's K-E-R-R-Y, and I grew up with that name, mm -hmm. Kerry. So people said, Kerry has dropped off the face of the earth. And they were right, I had sort of, not continued in the path of university mm. and I was they couldn't relate to what I was doing and it was challenging yeah but something was driving me what was uh, what does your faith mean for you in your daily life faith means everything to me from the time I wake till the time I go to sleep and <clears throat> uh, it's part of everything I do and uh, you know one does better one has failures, but the faith remains that, you know, you want to try and be, in quotes, a good person. You want to be of benefit to other people hmm. in the world. And uh, it's very much what I live with and what drives me. Yeah, because you decided to stay in Israel. Did you stay in Israel from that moment that you, you took the gap year uh, did you stay in Israel? I did. And what happened next? I studied. I studied for seven years mm -hmm. and I became a rabbi. En route, I had the good fortune of being introduced to my wife, Malki. Mm -hmm. And uh, we met and uh, ultimately we married. And we began building our own family while I was studying. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a beautiful daughter. We have a beautiful daughter who is today 47 years old. Mm -hmm. And then we... Uh, we're blessed with a boy. His name is Yossi, mm -hmm. Joseph in English. And uh, at the age of 11 months, my dear wife took him to a public health center to get a routine, what's called in those days, a DPT vaccination, diphtheria, pertussis, whooping cough, and tetanus. Mm -hmm. And unbeknown to the public, for six months, the Ministry of Health was having a problem with this batch of vaccine for reasons that nobody understands. They didn't stop it immediately. Yeah. And by the time this was finished six months later and they stopped it, hundreds of children were either died or injured. So this vaccine was actually very it dangerous. It was tainted, mm -hmm. it was tainted, it didn't hit. The nature of it is it doesn't injure everybody, but no. there was a problem that hundreds of children were injured. And my son was one of them. And I came home from my studies one day and the day that she gave the vaccine at three in the afternoon, <clears throat> and he wasn't the same child. Mm. Malki was hysterical, his eyes were, sh were glazed, they were moving, he was apathetic, he wasn't moving, he was almost a year old, he was yeah. a few weeks short of a year. So it wasn't a child of two months, this was a child that you knew already. And we went to a doctor, to a neurologist, and the neurologist asked in horror, did this child recently have a vaccine? She knew that there was a problem. And uh, from that moment, no one was willing to talk to us. It was like vaccine related. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we struggled. And a year later, my uncle was a big doctor in New York. He said, come out to New York and I'll put you in contact with some big doctors. And we went thinking we're going for three weeks, but we learned very quickly that what they weren't talking to us there, uh, that his optic nerve was injured. 
he will never see again. His hearing is damaged. Two years later, he was deaf. And we stayed. We stayed for four and a half years in New York. He went to a, a wonderful school there. Mm -hmm. And I went into the computer field in New York. And But he was blind and deaf. He was blind and deaf. Yeah. It was a very, it was a, as in English we say, our lives were flipped on their heads. Yeah, was it difficult for you and your wife to accept this? Because you have a healthy <clears throat> child, two children. It was very, very difficult. Yeah. The, it's, it's the first enormous challenge where, first of all, that God, why me? Mm. Second of all, maybe it's a mistake in the address. Like, what did we do to deserve this? And these are all things that every parent has to cope with, mm. has to deal with, and it changes you. And some people's faith is deepened. Some people's faith is weakened. Mm -hmm. uh, in our case, um, you know, what happened was, interestingly enough, that uh, my wife sometimes had women who visited her, religious women, and uh, they would talk to her and they would make a suggestion that you should get this child out of the house because you could not put a glass on the table. You couldn't put a vase on the table. Because he was kicking everything. it off. He, wasn't, he didn't see, he was in everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so life was all in plastic. Your other, we had, were blessed with several other young children. Mm. And the young children, he was into them as well without meaning to hurt anybody, no. but touching everything. Uh, and so the suggestion was made that, you know, if you want to have anywhere a typical normal life, you must find a setting outside the home for Yossi. And Malki at night, after having been told this by somebody very important, uh, She cried and said, God, I'm never taking Yossi out of the house. He's a gift of you to mm. me. But I promise you this, if you ever decide to help our Yossi, I am going to dedicate my life to helping other mothers with their children with disabilities. Right. And this happened on several occasions, once mm. in particular. So fast forward, we moved back to Israel, enrolled Yossi in the deaf school, And a woman in the deaf school who was deaf herself, a teacher, put one of his little palms on the table. And in the other palm, she fingerspelled five symbols for Hebrew letters. Somebody invented in the United States 150 years ago, for whatever reason, this is an A, this is a B. So in Israel, when they invented the symbols for the letters, They, wherever the sound was an A or a B, they made an Aleph or a Bet, etc. And where there wasn't, they invented new symbols. Mm. So with a Shin, Vav, Lamed, Chet, Nun, five Hebrew letters for the word table, Shulchan, she spelled those letters in his little palm days on end. And at some point, he smiled from ear to ear, and she realized that he had just had his what's called the Helen Keller breakthrough. Helen Keller was an American woman many years ago. Who was also blind. Blind and deaf, and, deaf and mm -hmm. she had the breakthrough, etc. Yeah. Because before that, you were actually not able to communicate Nothing. with Yossi. We could hug him, we could kiss yeah. him. They and Malki understood him in certain ways, as you do with anyone who can't mm. talk. But there was certainly no communication of yeah. that kind. And we learned very quickly The symbols of, it's only 22 letters, mm -hmm. and you learn to spell table, glass, ceiling, floor. From there it went to more complicated language. Mm -hmm. And it became very quickly clear that this child understood things that were not just names of objects, but feelings, um, abstract concepts, mm -hmm. and he was brilliant. And then uh, about a year later, a young speech therapist in the school said that she is now going to teach him how to speak Hebrew based on the work the first one had done. And we laughed. I mean, we couldn't understand how can you penetrate someone who can't hear and can't see. Mm. And it took her two years, and she actually taught him with, with an accent and synthetically, mm -hmm. but he learned to speak Hebrew. That's amazing. And so now you have a child who can communicate. And my dear wife sat me down in our little apartment in Jerusalem, mm -hmm and said, it's payback time. I made a promise. God has delivered, and I need your help. Well, I didn't know how to help. You know, it's like, I'm working. I have, this time I had six children. I worked as I ran a very large computer operation. 
and uh, had no idea what a nonprofit was. I had mm -hmm. no idea one even needed a nonprofit. I just wanted to help her, but had no idea how. One thing became clear: you need money. Mm -hmm. You can't rent a little apartment to, to host an after-school program for these families if you don't have the money. Mm -hmm. so, so your wife was actually the, the one who had the idea to found the organization Shalva. It's her vision. Yeah. She's the brains of the outfit and I'm yeah. just here to help her out. Right. I mean, it is absolutely her vision. She from every one of its details and it's continued on through 33 years till today mm -hmm. where it's not only she knew what pro she knew what the needs were she knew knew how to fill those gaps with programs that are meaningful and uh, that's exactly what she set out to do so it took us a number of years and someone in my hometown vancouver helped her start mm -hmm. and with five children in one rented apartment one after school program which was the first program her goal with that program was to provide as the name is the name is shalva Shalva is a Hebrew word that appears in all of the biblical writings mm -hmm. but once. Psalms 122, verse 7, mm -hmm. may there be peace in your walls, Shalva, serenity, in your palaces. Mm -hmm. And when people have a child with a disability, it is chaos. Mm -hmm. What's happening? What, you know, life changes very quickly. And I don't mean it's bad, the child. I mean to say simply the fact of the matter is that it's chaos. How do we deal with this? Mm -hmm. It's a new reality. And what Malki always wanted to do was to provide programs that should provide peace of mind, shalva, mm -hmm. serenity. And the way we do that is that she created a program in the after school so that the government provides schooling for every one of these children. But when they're young, they may come home at 1.32, 2.33. And Malki wanted, rather than that child come home, when mommy's in the middle of her day, she can't work, daddy can't work, somebody can't work, mm -hmm. or the siblings mm -hmm. have to suddenly take mm -hmm. care of the child. She wanted a program where the government brings the child to us. And in our center, we care for that child with a lot of fun, therapy, and, and great activities till 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. At 6 p.m., they have a hot meal, which Malki used to cook, and then the child is bused home from the center home, arriving home 6.30, quarter to 7. What that means is that mommy and daddy have now had the ability to have a normal, typical day. They can work, mm -hmm. they can make a living, they have two, three other children, those children can go to school and come home and do homework yeah. with mommy and daddy. It gives them a rest. It's, it's, it's revolutionary mm -hmm. that it's not a one day a week, help you out on Sundays, help you out on Mondays. Mm -hmm. It's every day of the work week that program exists mm -hmm. so that when a child comes in, their life is automatically changed. Yeah, it sounds like a very simple idea, but was it new back in the time? It's still new. It's still new. Nobody else does it anywhere. <laughs> it's, Why? So, it's the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. It's very, very simple. As a very big professor in uh, Israel said to me many, many years ago, mm -hmm. she says, with all my degrees, I could never have done this. And she, I said, why? She says, because it demanded a young mother who had the smarts to understand what the gaps were in Israel, mm -hmm. what the gaps were in the United States when we were there. And she had the smarts to understand how to fill those gaps mm. in a meaningful way. But it's a very comprehensive program, costs a great deal of money to mm -hmm. do. So most people are not going to do it. They'll give you one day a week, two afternoons a week, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary, it's very needed. But this is a comprehensive program. It's not an aspirin for a serious, uh, aspirin can help a headache. Mm -hmm. An aspirin won't help a more serious problem. Malki created mm -hmm. the after school. Mm -hmm. She never stopped. She then went to respite where every night of the week, children who come to the after-school program, a, a set of those children sleep over. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that's the work week in Israel. Mm -hmm. a, a group of children sleep from the after-school sleep over every night. And then there's summer camps all summer, and there's a sleepaway camp mm -hmm. to give people a break. And then there's a program for mothers who just gave birth to a child with a disability and Mummy is 
overwhelmed, mm. and the hospital knows to refer them to Shalva, and the program is called Me and My Mummy, and every day of the week, some 125 mothers a week come through there, but a group of mothers comes through on Sunday, Monday, they get five therapies, they learn how to do the therapy with mm -hmm. the child, so they go home for the week knowing how to help themselves. And they connect to other mothers. Mm -hmm. That is the point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The point is, Malki said, that neither doctors nor social workers will be able to help this right. mother. Only a community of other mothers. Mm -hmm. And that's what empowers them to move forward and get back to life. And right. if mummy is functioning, mm -hmm. the family is functioning. Yeah. You started with five children. Yes. How many children are being helped right now? A thousand a day. A thousand a day? Yes. That's an amazing growth. Huh? What, what were it the continue. challenges when you were growing so fast? Challenges were always there. Yeah. You know, people ask me, how do I cope today? The, the financial responsibility is enormous. Mm. And, and I say it's no different than it was in the beginning. In the be beginning, I didn't know how to raise money for five kids. Mm. And today, I'm sort of challenged trying to raise money for a thousand. Yeah. But it's just a different set of facts. But those children are from every part of the community. Uh, every ethnic background. Mm -hmm. and You're saying the, they're Jewish children? Non-Jewish children, yeah. whatever comes our way. It's mm -hmm. always been first come, first serve. And uh, today it's the mothers and babies. Mm -hmm. Then there's a daycare from one to three. There are preschools from four to six. And those preschools are completely in, uh, integrated. We have two full classes of kids who are healthy, typical children, some 70 kids. And they are the role models in interacting with mm -hmm. our other children. Then the after school program, the overnight, we now go in age from birth all the way through adulthood. Mm -hmm. We have employment, employment placement, training, vocational training. And we now have about 14 apartments in the community where each of those apartments houses either six young female adults mm -hmm. or six male, male. adults yeah. uh, but each of them live in a beautiful apartment mm -hmm. within a, a you know a mile and a half radius from our center yes. but the bigger thing is is that it grew and we went from one rented apartment to two then Malki built her own center in the 90s a magnificent center and a uh, 2005 the government of Israel came to me and said we have to put in many more children into your programs. If we give you a big piece of land, would you build? And I said, no, because I'm overwhelmed with what I'm doing. But they insisted I see the land, and mm -hmm. I did. Now, a very challenging piece of land with a lot of dirt, mountains on it. In Jerusalem. Right? right, in the heart of Jerusalem. And the incredible thing is that it was seven acres. It's a very big piece yeah. of land. And my wife and I both said, it is not a crime to fail, but such an opportunity where the government gives a nonprofit mm -hmm. in the heart of the city such a big piece of land will never happen again. So we said yes. It was a hard, difficult process, but ultimately we got the land and we built and we built on that land uh, 222,000 square meters, 12 floors, enormous, enormous building, mm -hmm. magnificent. And uh, we now are able to cater to 1,000 people today. Right. We saw it in the video, of course, at the beginning of this interview. It looks perfect. It looks beautiful. It looks like you don't really need the money because everything is there. Thank you for asking that question. Mm. This is one of our challenges. We believe in giving dignity to everybody who walks through that door. This is not about a child only. It's about a mother, a father, a brother, a sibling. It's about the general community where 200,000 visitors come every year to see our building mm -hmm. and to feel it. And we have a fabulous cafe. They come to eat. And we're impacting the world around us from all over the world are coming today. So we're impacting in a very great way. But in terms of money, um, we have a budget of $25 million. We have mm. 500 staff. Um, out of that budget, the government provides about 40% of the funding. So 60% you have to have and we from have, donations. We have also, no, we have the cafe and events. Mm -hmm. We have thousands of people coming to do events in our beautiful facilities, the mm. auditorium, etc. And the bottom line is, 
that we have to raise in order to stay alive mm. about seven million dollars a year. And that so, means actually for paying the staff to take care of the children. It means for taking care of the staff, the, yeah. all the expenses in running that center right. that the government is not providing or the other. But the fact is that we have a seven million dollar deficit every year that I and several others run around the world mm -hmm. trying very hard to keep it together. It's an enormous challenge and you know I cannot begin to tell you mm -hmm. what it means that I'm in Holland and Christian Friends of Israel are our partners. Yeah, because Christians for Israel started this year to support Shalva and we had uh, quite a lot of concerts where we showed the video uh, asking people to give the donations for the, these children with uh, special needs. You are an observant Jewish person. We are a Christian organization. Does that conflict in some way? Not for me. No? No, not at all. Don't forget, I grew up in a broader community mm -hmm. with broad experiences, with a, you know, growing up with a very mixed culture mm -hmm. where we had predominantly Christian community and Jews or others, but that was the community and I grew up with my dear friends. Mm. And uh, I was once asked this question by a very significant Christian preacher in Israel. He was visiting and he said, how could it be that you're friendly with an, another person he knew who was a, you know, an American preacher? And I said, I don't understand your question. So he repeated it. I said, well, let me share something with you. In every point in life, we have a choice of focusing on com commonalities, what we have in common, and our differences. We can focus on our differences, but we won't go too far. Mm -hmm. I said, when I deal with, mm -hmm. in this case, you're asking me about a preacher, I said, the commonalities that I see is that number one, we both believe in God. Number two, we both believe that God knows what's going on down here. And number three, we believe that God gets involved in each of our lives. Mm -hmm. So. That's a pretty broad, broad spectrum of commonalities. You want to go into the details? Okay, we're going to have some differences. But if we stick to the, the general beliefs that we all abide to, sure, yeah. and more importantly, we all believe that man is created in the image of God. Mm. And when you believe that man is created in the image of God, there was there's one God, and man is someone who... Each of us is the same in that regard. And when you believe that, which is what we believe very strongly, so you want to give dignity to that person mm -hmm. and you want to find areas to work together. And this is one of the ways of working together. This is extraordinary. Yeah. It's yeah. very meaningful to me. I am so excited and I'm so impressed with your organization mm -hmm. and, and its core beliefs in Israel. And I'm, I was deeply, deeply moved when I learned more about it. Hmm. Uh, let's talk about October, because in October, uh, a group, a music group from Shalva will come to the Netherlands. Uh, tell me about this group. We call it the Shalva Band. Yeah. I created it in 2005 mm -hmm. uh, with a young man who had just got out of the army and he'd been injured and he was a musician. And uh, we started with this goal of seeing if we can create a band. And we always had music in Shalva before him, but he focused and developed this much further. And ultimately he created a band that played it first in-house and then out of house. And then we decided we're gonna send them on an international tour. Mm -hmm. And they did, they went on an international tour. And- um, They are all, uh, all the people in the band the, are the people, two lead, children the, from Shalva, right? Yes, yeah. the two lead singers mm -hmm. are young ladies, mm -hmm. both of them are blind, but they're capable people. Mm -hmm. It's not, they haven't got mental, the cognitive mm -hmm. or mental challenges. And, and you have the two of the children were uh, Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And the drummer had something called Williams syndrome, which is, it's a syndrome, but one of the components of the syndrome is it sometimes comes with great musical ability. He mm -hmm. had that. And the keyboard artist was had 10% vision in one eye and uh, there was eight members of the band and they were picked up by an Israeli television show that heard them play from the States uh, that they should, it's like America has talent. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were asked to come in audition and they were immediately accepted and 
when they competed in this contest, we knew that the winner of this television contest will represent Israel in Eurovision. Okay. So it was a big deal and a very well-watched program. So we didn't know how far they would go, maybe once, maybe twice, if we were lucky. They went all the way to the finals, and they were the first to get to the finals. And when they got there, we learned from the Israeli television people that Eurovision authorities had told them that while we were told that they had to play, if they were to get into Eurovision, they would play Saturday night, there had to be a dress rehearsal on Friday night, which meant that four of those eight kids were religious, they would not be able to play. No, because Saturday night. night is after Shabbat, but Friday night is Friday night is the Shabbat. heart of Shabbat, yeah. exactly. Mm. So the children came to a decision that we came in as a family, we're going to lose a family, mm. leave as a family. This was enormous headline news in Israel because they had gone into the hearts and souls mm -hmm. of every Israeli television watcher, viewer. And now, are, is the Shalva band going to leave? Or are they not going to leave? They announced they're leaving, and it was, I say, very moving in Israel. Mm -hmm. And about a week later, we learned that Eurovision had come back to the television in Israel, that while they cannot compete as contestants, we want them to, to perform at Eurovision on the big screen. Mm -hmm. And they did. And they sang the song A Million Dreams from the movie I think the whole world saw this uh, very, very... 200 difficult. million people certainly mm -hmm. saw it. Yeah. And it put the world of disabilities on the map in a way. The BBC, who was not always friendly to Israel, mm -hmm. immediately tweeted 10 minutes after they were on stage, this is what Eurovision is about and these are the winners. And it had great impact all over Europe yeah. and all over. So. The band is still playing. Yeah, the band, and they're coming to Holland. And they're coming to Holland. And what can we expect for people? Because, of course, everybody uh, who is watching this show can come to you one can, of the concerts. You can, you can expect a Eurovision quality show. Mm -hmm. They are professionals mm -hmm. and they are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And there will not be a dry eye and no one will remain sitting in their seats. And what... For you, because obviously you have heard them perform quite a lot of times. What is your favorite song that they perform? If I have to have a favorite song, it's the <laughs> one I told them to sing. Okay. When they started, they asked me, they said that the Israeli television company wanted them to sing a particular Hebrew song. And they thought that maybe they should sing something for the Beatles. And I said, you're right. You sing in English and sing Here Comes the Sun. Mm -hmm. So they said, why here comes the sun? I said, because you are the sun. You are going to bring warmth and light to people. And they sang, here comes the sun. And when that curtain in the studio went up in the television show, mm -hmm. I was unaware there was a camera on me. But I exploded with emotion and with crying. <laughs> and I became a marked man. Because wherever I go, ah, you're the rabbi. You're the one who cried. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your favorite one. Absolutely. Okay. We're coming to the end, more or less, of this interview. Uh, what is your hope for the future of Shalva? I'm very hopeful. It's impacting the world in mm -hmm. enormous ways. Um, the world of disability has been changed. And we, as I say, 200,000 people a year continue to come. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book called Dreams Never Dreamed. And the reason for that book is a story behind Shalva and the challenges we faced. Mm -hmm. But I never dreamt as a, someone who grew up in Vancouver, non-religious, that one day I would be talking to you, looking the way I look, living in Israel, etc. cetera, as a, as a rabbi. Uh, when Yossi was injured, we never dreamt that he would ever be able to talk to our son again. Mm -hmm. And when Yossi had his breakthrough, we never dreamt that out of that would come Shalva and everything that has come came out. So I've stopped thinking about what's next. I just know that new dreams are happening, mm -hmm. and they are. We now have what's called the Shalva Institute, where we share what we do. The world has a great thirst for this, mm -hmm. and it is becoming somewhere where we're impacting. With, we no longer have to travel to every country. There's Zoom, and we're involved helping with what we knew very humbly share the knowledge share the knowledge and we're, mm -hmm. we're in the 
the Arab countries, the Emirates, I mean, within reason, the Emirates, mm. etc., and and all over the world. And so I really couldn't tell you what the next dream will be, mm. but I can tell you one thing, God willing, there will be many more. Yeah, I have one more question for you. What is your hope for Yossi? Yossi, if I can take one minute. Sure. Yossi is today 46. Yossi is blind, he's deaf, he can't walk, he's in a wheelchair for the last 25 years, and yet nothing stops him. He wanted to meet the President of the United States, he was hosted by President Bush, he wanted to meet the Prime Minister of England, he's hosted by, forget who, one of the Prime Ministers. He identified cars by door handles, mm -hmm. Volvo had him out in, you know, to see his Volvo, favorite Volvo. He rides horses, he wanted to ride elephants, we did not know how to make that happen, one day a friend of his was in Thailand and yeah. he wrote my wife a note, Malki, I'm in Thailand for a few weeks, there's elephants, no more vaccines needed here, just send me Yossi. Another mutual friend went with Yossi and he uh, flew out with a kid that can't hear, can't mm -hmm. see, etc. He got to Thailand and uh, a few days later I was in a meeting with three American congressmen and telling them about Shalva and a secretary banged on the door and said, forgive me, but you must look at your email now. And I looked at my email and I saw Yossi with these two guys on the elephant in yeah. Thailand and Yossi's smiling. And I broke down, I started to cry and I said to the congressman, I said, gentlemen, as I get older, I think I sl slow down in my passions and my dreams. Mm -hmm. Yossi has no right to dream. He can't get out of bed in the morning by himself. He can't see, he can't walk, he can't he can't do anything by himself. And yet, he's a guy that never stops dreaming. And more than that, God somehow helps him realize his dreams. I said, if there's a message for me and for us, mm -hmm. I think that at every stage in life, we have to learn from Yossi, continue to dream, continue to have passion. It's mm -hmm. never too late to do anything we want in life and not let anybody stand in our way. It's and a good lesson for all of if us. If it's a message for our viewers today, mm -hmm. I would say that is the message. Let's learn from Yossi and let's continue to dream and continue to have goals and may God help us all. Thank you very much, Kalman, for coming to our studio. En u thuis natuurlijk ook bedankt voor het kijken naar deze uitzending van Christen voor Israël. En u kunt het werk van Shalva steunen. Dat kan via onze website www.cvi.nl slash Shalva. En daar ziet u meer informatie over de organisatie. Ook de video die u aan het begin van deze uitzending hebt gezien. En daar kunt u een gift over maken. En zoals Kalman al noemde, de giften zijn hard nodig. En als Christen voor Israël willen we ons speciaal inzetten voor een nieuwe afdeling voor jongvolwassenen bij Shalva. Dus als u dat wilt steunen, heel erg van harte welkom. U kunt terecht op onze website cvi.nl slash Shalva. Nogmaals, heel erg bedankt voor het kijken en graag tot de volgende keer.